I think it's pretty natural to be a little bit sentimental as you see a, a year coming to an end, even though for some of us we've seen a lot of years come to an end and uh, new ones begin, but uh, I, I think about my uh, time here and I think about back in 2011 when Kathy and I first came down and tried out to preach here. And uh, we couldn't even pronounce the name of this town. Uh, we knew nobody. Uh, you did not know us. We didn't know you. And uh, I am grateful to God that he has led me here. And I mean that very sincerely. As I look out and I see some of my dearest friends in the whole world are right here. And I just am so thankful that God has led us to this congregation. And if you've not been other places, you really don't understand possibly what a wonderful situation we have here. Uh, we're just so blessed to have so many people who care about the welfare of this church. And I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for being who you are and for us having such a wonderful year together and looking forward to this next year being great. We're going to be in Luke chapter 17. You can be turning there and get your outline out. We will begin here in a moment looking through that. We're going to talk about gratitude. And I want, to, I want to put an idea in your head. You don't have to accept this, but I want you to think about what gratefulness is. Here's the way I think about gratefulness. You know, when we're grateful... We're usually grateful for that which satisfies us. Can you understand that? If it's satisfying, then I'm grateful for that. And then the next step in my mind is if I am satisfied, then that means I am content. Can you see that? Just file that away in your brain, and I'm going to bring that up later on in the sermon again. But I want you to think about that. So gratification comes from being content and we express that in our gratefulness so there's a correlation between being grateful and being content just think about that a little bit as we turn to our passage in Luke chapter 17 and the point number one that I want to make is Jesus healed many but not all of them were grateful we know how many times Jesus healed people and we have a specific example we're going to look at here where Jesus healed ten lepers, but not all of them were grateful for their healing. Let's read together in 17, Luke 17, starting in verse 11. While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, remember there's ten of them. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. When Jesus answered and said, were, not, were there not ten cleansed, but the nine? Where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner and he said to him stand up and go your faith has made you well this is Luke 17 and even though the Gospels are not necessarily in chronological order and that's just because in Eastern culture they didn't really care about chronology the way we do in America it bugs us the things aren't in order it didn't bother them but it probably is toward the end of the ministry. And since Jesus, it says in verse 11, is going to Jerusalem, this is most likely the time when he was going back to Jerusalem 
for the final time. He announced in Matthew chapter 16 that he was going to have to return to Jerusalem. He was going to have to be uh, killed. He would be turned over to the chief priests and the elders, and they were going to crucify him, and on the third day he was going to be raised. So he's on his way back. He goes to a village. We don't know which village this is. He's going to a village, and he's approached by ten leprous men. Imagine that. Ten leprous men. That's quite a a big group to come to be healed by Jesus. A lot of times he would heal one or two, but this time he has ten leprous men that come. They stand at a distance, which they are, were commanded to do. They had to do because leprosy was a contagious disease. And they cried out, Jesus, have mercy on us. How many of you know the difference between mercy and grace? I know that's kind of a confusing thing, and so I, I want to put up here uh, in just a minute, I'll show you how to know the difference. But let me, uh, point number two, these ten lepers were begging Jesus for mercy in verse 13. Let me show you the difference between the two. Mercy is not receiving the bad we deserve, and grace is receiving the good that we don't deserve. That's as simple as I know how to put it. So mercy is when we really have something bad that's supposed to happen to us, and it doesn't happen for some reason, that's receiving mercy. But when you don't deserve something that's good and you get it anyway, that's grace. And so that's the difference between mercy and grace. We are so fortunate to receive God's mercy, and these lepers were very fortunate to receive this healing from Jesus. Leprosy was incurable until 1940. And I, I could have shown you some much worse pictures than this, by the way, but I want you to see what leprosy does. It is a flesh-eating disease. It eats away at your extremities, and fingers fall off, and uh, toes, and eventually feet, and hands, and it's just a terrible, debilitating uh, disease. It just slowly eats away at your flesh. In 1940, uh, Dr. Guy Faget with the National Hansen's Disease Center in Carsville, Louisiana, discovered the cure for leprosy. It's a uh, medicine called sulfon, sulfon. And he, he discovered that, and it's been used ever since then to treat. But up to that time, up till 1940, there was really no cure for leprosy. And especially during this time that we're reading about. If you had leprosy, you were going to have it the rest of your life, and you were going to die a very slow and painful death. Point number three, those infected with the M. leprae bacteria, that's what it was, leprosy, they were condemned to a lifetime of seclusion and slow, painful death. In Leviticus chapter 13, verses 45 and 46, it says, As for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn, the hair of his head shall be uncovered, and uh, he shall cover his mustache. Clean. And he shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Uh, if you get a moment, read Leviticus chapter 13. I read an article this week that I thought was rather interesting. It called Leviticus chapter 13, from a medical standpoint, the most interesting chapter in the Bible. If you read that, it's, it's a description of how a, person, a priest was supposed to diagnose the skin disease and how to determine whether it really was leprosy, how to recognize certain things, and then they would go into a quarantine for a little while, come back, they would check it again, and finally would be determined whether the person had leprosy or not. And uh, it's, of course, very crude in its uh, diagnosis, but you got to remember this was the 1300s B.C., and they didn't have microscopes, and they didn't even know what a germ was or bacteria. And it really was a very effective way for God to 
instruct his people on how to protect themselves uh, against this contagion. Very interesting uh, study. So we know uh, number four here, these 10 lepers, they didn't even make it to the priest and they were cleansed. That's what verse 14 says. They were on their way. And they were cleansed. He said, go show yourself to the priest. And they didn't even get to the priest. And they were cleansed. And yet, only one took the time to come and to thank Jesus. Verse 15. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God, loud voice, falls on his face before Jesus, thanks him. And it says, and he was a Samaritan. Now, the way that's worded, and this one was a Samaritan, we kind of imply that the other nine possibly were not Samaritans. And if they weren't Samaritans, they were Jews. Now, in a leper colony, it didn't matter if you were a leper or Jew. We know from John chapter 4 that that Jews did not associate with Samaritans. But leprosy has a way of leveling that, that field out. They live together in the colony, but only the Samaritan returns and gives thanks to God. I want to make this point, and I think this one's rather important. Number five, genuine gratitude finds a way of expression. If you truly are grateful, you're going to find some way to let that be known, to express your gratitude. I was searching around on the the web this week and I found this article, just six things that you can do to express to a person or to persons that you are grateful for them. Write a thank you note, tell someone how much they mean to you, spend time together, smile, pay it back, or if they don't want you to pay it back, pay it forward. A simple thank you says it all. I mean, these are things we could do before we leave the building today, isn't it? You know, if you're thinking of somebody that I just haven't told how much I appreciate them or how grateful I am for them, uh, this is something you could do tonight before you leave. But we also want to look at how much we appreciate God as well as others. Number six, each time we assemble as Christians, it's to express to God how grateful we are for his mercy and his grace. That's why we're here today. Whether you realize it or not, we assemble so that we can tell God. Everything that we do is an expression to God of how grateful we are. That's why it's called worship. That's what worship means. Proskuneo is the Greek word. It means to kiss toward. We're kissing toward God when we're singing, when we're taking the supper, when we're putting money in the offering. All that we do is a, a kiss toward God, an expression of our worship. And so number seven, when you think about it, we at some point begged God, just like these lepers, we begged God to forgive our sins. And he did. Isn't that something to be grateful for? We we were in the same boat as these lepers. We faced a hopeless end, and Jesus gave us endless hope. Isn't that wonderful? So much to be grateful for. Number eight, our personal gratitude should motivate us to let God know we appreciate his mercy. You can't help but hear the disappointment in Jesus' voice in verse 17 where he says, We're not ten cleansed, but the nine. Where are they? They couldn't at least come back and say, Thank you for healing me. Thank you for rescuing me from a lifelong disease that there's absolutely no cure for. Where were the nine? Just our our gratitude should motivate us to want to to express that to God in some way. You know, you really shouldn't need an arm twisting to get to church. You shouldn't need that. 
Now, maybe you had to get one today so you would be here, but really, you should be here because you want to be here, because you're grateful, because you understand this is what Jesus did for me. And I'm, I just, I want to be here. I need to be here. I need to be here to express to him, not because my parents made me or because I, I feel like I got to punch my ticket, but just because I'm grateful to God for what he has done for me. That's the proper motivation for serving God and for worshiping him. Number nine, gratitude is something which should be shown rather than just assumed. Now, we've got to go to Hebrews chapter 12 to see this. In Hebrews chapter 12, please join me in verse 25 of Hebrews chapter 12. Where it says, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Now, in my translation, him is capitalized. Maybe yours is as well. That means it's referring to God. Him who is speaking. God who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth. Now, in this instance, him is not capitalized which means it's referring to Moses back in verse 21. So when Moses warned on earth, they refused, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. Again, him meaning God, capitalized. Verse 26, and his voice, God's voice, shook the earth then, but now he, again capitalized, God, has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. His expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now stick with me here. What's he saying? He says that the temporary thing, that's all, that's all removed. That's all, the things that can be shaken, this physical thing, that's all removed. So that what cannot be shaken, the spiritual, that's what remains. Verse 28, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Did Jesus not say in John chapter 18 and verse 36, my kingdom's not of this world? Did he not say that? So the kingdom is not a physical kingdom, is it? It's a spiritual kingdom that we are blessed to be a part of. We receive a kingdom, we have received a kingdom, which cannot be shaken. That's why when Christ created the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Because it's not a physical one. It, there's nothing Satan can do about it. The kingdom is the kingdom and will always be the kingdom. And there's nothing he can do about it. It is a spiritual kingdom. It's not a physical kingdom that we're blessed to receive. Now, what should we do in verse 28? Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. Let us show gratitude, not just have gratitude, right? Look what he says. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. See what he's saying there? If you really have the gratitude, you want to express that. You want to show it. You just don't want to say, well, yeah, I, I, I really, I'm grateful to God and I'm sure he knows. Well, yeah, he does, but he wants you to show it. That's like telling your wife, I, I, I told you I loved you when I married you, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> That's not a good thing to say. No. <laughs> no, you need to let her know. You need to let God know. You need to show your gratitude. It, it should be something that's visible. Where God, you're, you're telling God, God, I love you, and I am so grateful. And he's saying, I know, I can tell. I can tell by the way you live each day. I can tell by the effort you're putting into your faith. It's evident. You love me. You are grateful to me. God's saying, I know. Show it. Don't just assume. Show that you love God. Number 10, gratitude. 
should motivate us to want to be more firmly established in our faith. Now, we have to go to Colossians for this one. So turn back to the left to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. And I, I want to read more of this, the context, but I think verse 6 and 7 will accomplish our purpose this evening. Colossians 2, verse 6 says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed. Now look at this and overflowing with gratitude. If I am overflowing with gratitude, what does this text say I'm going to do? It says I'm going to walk in him. It says that I am going to be firmly rooted in him. I'm going to be built up in him. I am going to be established in my faith because I am overflowing with gratitude. You see what grateful does for us? Just why are you doing this? Because I'm so grateful. That's my motive. That should be my motive, shouldn't it? Not I'm doing this because, man, if I don't, then mom's going to say this or dad's going to say that or people are not going to like me as well or it's, it's good for my business if I'm going to church, it looks good in the community. What is that all about? <laughs> the reason we should be attending services, the reason we should be sharing our faith, the reason we should be singing, worshiping, all that we do is because I'm just so grateful to God. I want to be established in my faith. I want my faith to grow because I understand what God has done for me. Every prayer you should pray should be in gratitude. I know chapter 4, verse 2 is not in your notes, but I'm going to read it anyway. Uh, chapter 4 of Colossians, verse 2 says, Devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Now, if you're giving thanks, it's because you're grateful. Is that a stretch or, or are you with me on that? Thanksgiving is an expression of gratitude. I'm giving thanks because I am grateful. When am I, when am I telling God how grateful I am? In prayer. Every prayer we're praying is, God, I'm praying to you because I am so grateful and I'm grateful that you hear me. It's the motivation for everything that we do. It's because we're grateful. So because of that, number 11, I want you to stop and think about all that God has given you, all which you have to be grateful for. Just take a moment to think about that. And as you're doing that, don't, don't let the, the illustration of the 10 lepers in Luke 17, don't let that be lost on you. Because whether you realize it or not, you one time had an incurable disease. It's called sin. And it was rotting your flesh. And it was keeping you isolated, separated from God, outside the camp. That's where you were. And as you were dying in your sin, you came before Jesus, the Savior, and said, Jesus, have mercy on me. Please forgive me. And he says, I extend mercy to you. And when you surrendered to the waters of baptism, all your sins were washed away and you were made clean and you no longer had that sickening disease of sin. Now tell me again why you don't have anything to be grateful for. We have so much, so much to be thankful for. God has done so much for us. Another question for you, number 12 here. Have you adequately expressed to God today how grateful you are for what he has done for you? Now, I asked you earlier to think about the idea of, okay, if we're grateful we're grateful for the things that we are satisfied with. And if we're satisfied, that means that we are content. And if we're content, we're saying, I don't need anything else. 
Is that how you feel when you stand before God? Do you stand before God and say, God, I don't need anything else. You've already given me more than I deserve. I am content with what I have. That is what gratitude does for us. And when you are here, and, and this is Sunday, and we've been here, we worship this morning, we're worshiping again tonight. Today, have you expressed to God how grateful you are? I know some of you think, well, Curtis, I'm, I'm here. Doesn't that say a lot? I, mean, I sang the songs. I prayed the prayers. I, I, I took the supper. I put money in the offering. That's, that's it, right? Well, that's good. <laughs> that's all good. But you can do all those things and really not even be grateful to God. Did you personally express to God today how grateful you are for what he has personally done for you? One more before we close out. Number 13, have you told others how much you appreciate them? Now I'm gonna tell you, I think we do pretty good in this one. I overhear, I'm not eavesdropping, but I overhear conversations a lot as, I, as we're in fellowship time. And a lot of times I'll hear somebody telling somebody else how much I, I appreciate you. I appreciate what you did. I think most of our teachers uh, get to hear that a lot here that uh, they are appreciated for what they do. Uh, our song leaders, those who serve on the supper, those who do the greeters, everything that's done, the, the card ladies, uh, we're, we're pretty good at that. But uh, make sure that you are personally doing that, that you are one who's expressing to others how grateful you are. I do have one more question for you. Are you grateful for the blood of Jesus? Are you grateful for the blood of Jesus? Because that's the only thing that will save us is that precious blood of Jesus. And you can receive that tonight if you're outside of Christ and you would like to come to know him. All you have to do is come to Jesus and say, Jesus, have mercy on me. I need to be forgiven. Repent of your sins. Be baptized into Christ. And you can receive that salvation. If you've done that, but maybe you've not been as grateful as you need to be and you're needing prayers as well, please come as we stand and sing.